Very few people actually appreciate the importance of our rivers. Not only are they vital for our community, our livestock, uh, agriculture, flood defences and so much more, but they also form natural boundaries between counties. Now I'm going to explore the River Welland, which starts at a little village called Sibitoft as a spring in the ground and runs 105 kilometres, eventually emptying into the wash. Along my journey I'll visit some beautiful towns and villages, I'll meet people who make their livings from the Welland, uh, people who enjoy uh, the Welland for recreational purposes and also talk to somebody who cares for the River Welland. My journey begins in the picturesque village of Sibitoft where the River Welland starts its life as a few little springs in open fields. It runs northeast over open countryside in the direction of Market Harbour. The importance of the River Welland cannot be stressed enough as it forms natural boundaries between Leicestershire, Northamptonshire, Rutland and Lincolnshire. And with a route of around 105 kilometres, I've certainly got my work cut out. As it meanders on its journey, it comprises of nothing more than a few little streams taken in water from the fields. It's hard to imagine that this will end its life as a wide open channel pouring into the sea. The river passes through Wellham, continues east and then turns north near Rockingham where the Eye Brook helps swell the flow. Water is regulated from the Eye Brook Reservoir where the dam busters train for their World War II operation. The river then passes above Gretton to Thorpe and then into Market Harbour. So I've made it as far as Market Harbour today and in Market Harbour the uh, River Welland is running through uh, Welland Park. They've uh, made a feature of it and uh, it seems to be enjoyed by everybody. And after the Welland Park, the Welland goes off and under the town and on to its next destination. So I'm here in the village of Duddington uh, where the Welland is uh, crossed by two bridges and we're going to go and take a look.
And right on the boundary between Barrowden and Wakeley, there's the most beautiful bridge, and it's also on the boundary of Rutland. And just behind me is the Harringworth Viaduct. This viaduct opened to traffic in 1880. By the time the river reaches Barrowden, it's widened somewhat. It then passes Wakeley and reaches Tixover where you can see the abandoned church. By this point it's taken on the appearance of a real river. It's wider and it's got long stretches of straits with wide sweeping bends. In between Liddington and Gretton uh, you'll find uh, Gretton Weir. As we enter Stamford, the Welland splits into two and forms an integral part of the Town Meadows recreation area. It's crossed by a series of small footbridges. Stamford has been regarded as one of the finest stone towns in England, and so beautiful are the buildings in Stamford that the town has been featured in many movies and TV series. As the two parts of the Welland join, it runs through the heart of the town and under a beautiful three-arch stone bridge that carries the A43. This was built in 1849. It's hard to imagine that before the Stamford Bypass opened in 1966, the A1 actually ran through the centre of Stamford, including over this bridge. So I've made it as far as West Deeping, and it's a beautiful morning, and this is one of the points where the River Welland splits again. And what it's done, it's split into two, um, probably best described as brooks. Um, they're only a, probably a, a foot 18 inches deep and maybe eight to ten feet wide so it splits and then it meets again just after the weir and the bridge there uh, but behind me you can see the most beautiful church of St Andrew and um, it's an absolutely glorious location There's some quite large fish in here, and uh, I think they're brown trout. Yeah, very good size. The Welland continues to flow northeast towards the sea, passing through Market Deeping, another wonderful market town, where it flows south of the town centre. At its widest, it's around 16 feet wide, and for the most, it's very shallow. There's a lock gate here and a weir. As I've been doing my walk, it's been uh, quite wonderful actually. I've seen some beautiful sights and uh, heard some lovely sounds. And what I've learned about uh, these kind of walks, especially on, on a river like, such as this, is not just to open your eyes, but to open your ears. 
and I've actually arrived at the Deeping Lakes Nature Reserve and I'm going to take real advantage of this and I'm going to sit and listen to the birds and uh, I'll, I'll play you some of the uh, soundtrack that's recorded. It's quite amazing. So I'm here at Deeping Lakes and I'm listening to the wildlife out on the lakes and it's, it's absolutely incredible. And I'll play you back in the track now that I'm actually recording. Having then passed Deeping St James, the Welland is met by the Maxi Cut near Peakirk. My journey's brought me as far as uh, the village of Peakirk and I, I'm almost speechless. The River Welland here is absolutely stunning and I've reached the pumping station just here behind me and I'm going to have a look what's the other side um, but it, it's just absolutely glorious and I've just spoken to uh, a local dog walker and he said that uh, not too long ago earlier today he spotted some otters along the riverbank so uh, maybe I'll be uh, lucky and have a look but uh, yeah, it's absolutely stunning. Just off there is the uh, Maxi Cut and it's joining the Welland at this junction and uh, you can see just over there it's absolutely full of swans. What an incredible place. And this is such a beautiful place I've decided to take a short break here um, before making my way along the bank there towards Crowland. As the River Welland goes around Crowland, you have to wonder at the size of this river, considering how we saw it when it started as a tiny spring in, in Sibertoft, um, it, it's just incredible. And Crowland's also a really important place on the Welland because uh, in 1947, it's a year that will go down in history, um, something really major happened here. And uh, I'm going to meet somebody who was around at the time and, and see how he, he remembers it. I remember back in 47 when we had a very, very bad winter. Uh, all the cubic wash was flooded from Spalding down to Crowland. Uh, it, it was ice on the water, the, the flood water, uh, that made it easy for the skaters. Uh, the Welland was flooded in various places between uh, Cragbank, which is Little London End. Uh, it was flooded basically from Spalding Park Centre all the way down to Crowland. 
I lived in a house in Crutchbank, which if I wanted to get to the Welland, I'd got to say 20 or 30 paces and I was on the ed side of the Welland. The Welland then was much different than it is at the moment. There was no piles in the sides and you could get right down to the water then with no problem at all. Uh, right opposite of where I lived, there was then a pumping station and they had made a river called the New River that fed into uh, the Welland. Obviously it had to do because the pumping station used to, when it started up, took the water from off the Cubbit Wash and pumped it into the Welland. I think it was in that year when they sandbagged actually from Barrier Bank, that's where the New River started, all the way into Spalding Town Centre, both Cubitt Road and London Road. The events of the flooding of 47, I'd say we're unlikely to see again um, with the current conditions. The, the cutting of the Coronation Channel um, alleviated the problems with Spalding and the evidence has been that the Crowland and Cubitt washes have never been flooded since and the events of 1947 were a breach in the wash bank. Um, a couple of times in recent past, Easter 98, we very nearly saw the washes flooded again but that's what the washes are there for so, uh, so uh, in current situation I think we're unlikely to see wide-scale flooding from this part of the Welland. In 1947, when the River Welland burst its banks uh, due to the harsh winter, and if it wasn't for a, a really special operation using some military vehicles, then who knows what would have happened. Um, it, it would have been a total disaster. And uh, I'm going to meet one of the guys who knows quite a bit about that uh, event in history. In 1947, these Buffalo LVT-4s came to Crowland uh, to act as a temporary uh, flood defence. Due to the flood defence barrier breaking on March the 21st. So the Buffaloes uh, were put into position and they removed the bungs from underneath and flooded them to weigh them down. They told the residents that these were tanks. These are no tanks, these are amphibian vehicles and on the brass plaque on board of this one uh, it says amphibian tractor. So in 1947 they built a sandbag wall down this side and then used Summerfield uh, mesh in between here what they used in D-Day for the landing strips. They then decided to fill pump the water back into the flood defence between the River Welland and Crowland when the, when the dam was sealed on the 29th of March 1947. If it hadn't have been done with these amphibious vehicles then the water would have kept on pouring through. At the end of it the water covered 35,000 acres of farmland as far as Thorny round to Newborough. This was an amazing amount of pressure and the pressure that resulted after 16 of these were in position by the beginning of April the, the first 16 was washed away by five buffaloes moving. So five buffaloes moved and there's a newspaper article stating that they were washed away like matchsticks. We discovered this uh, in 2019 via doing scans on the ground. Uh, we had RAF bomb disposal team in, then we had a drone doing a survey, and then we've had uh, a chap, uh, Stephen Openshaw from uh, Lancashire. He then scanned the ground and uh, it revealed that there were some red blobs underground. And with that, we then brought in machinery to start digging for it. The buffalo was 38 feet down on one corner, 
30 foot on the another corner and 28 foot at the back. In the 1947, they reported the gouge hole of being 28 feet. So this wouldn't have been possible without Cronin Crane's Tears Recovery and North Level Drainage Board. This dream has gone far wider than any of us would have imagined. We went global by the first half an hour when it was in the hole. We have now gone further than, you know, I have phone calls from Australia, phone calls from um, Holland and various places. And the amount of people on board, the gearbox was reconditioned by David Brown, free of charge. The tracks we've located in Holland that are due to go on any day. I just, it's just gone further. Michael Sly at Thorny, locating an engine and they've got it running. The ultimate dream of this buffalo is to have a museum so that we can educate children and future generations of our pastimes. As I walk from Crowland towards Spalding, I pass Cradge Bank, where the river is a wide and almost straight channel with the occasional sweeping bend. The river has really grown in size by this point. So after the section uh, of Cradge Bank, where the River Welland's really wide and almost straight, um, we approach the area of Little London, and it's here we find the Welland Yachting Club. And the Welland Yachting Club really do take advantage of the river here. Um, they've got all sorts of uh, water events on and uh, I believe they've got a really good sailing team as well. So as the river reaches Little London and passes under the bridge, um, it, it tends to narrow a little bit there and it's more like a, a, a small town river and that's mainly due to the Coronation Channel and we'll talk about that shortly. So the next part of my journey takes me through Spalding, beautiful market town. And the River Welland uh, runs all the way through the centre of town, uh, from High Bridge uh, in the town centre, uh, down to just behind me, which is uh, known as the Twin Bridges. And uh, following that, I'm going to walk from here to Surfleet. So in Spalding it's quite obvious that people actually care for our river and our community and uh, we've actually got a team of uh, river wombles and they're regularly uh, out on the river uh, collecting all the rubbish they do a wonderful job. It's hard to imagine that the Welland in Spalding was once navigable for large sailing boats and fish was once brought in and landed here. Just behind me is a, a dam. This is called the Coronation Dam and it sits on the Coronation Channel which just behind there is connected to the River Welland. And uh, this channel was cut in 1953 and was designed to take water from the Welland and go around the outskirts of Spalding basically to prevent flooding. And so far so good it seems to have done the job. So just here we can see where the, uh, the Welland joins the Coronation Channel just on the outskirts of Spalding and from here on the Welland runs off to Surfleet. So over the years the River Welland's changed considerably and 
Some of it's to do with uh, the demand for water and flooding defences and things like that, to do with agriculture. And as a result, some of the smaller tributaries of the Welland have dried up and disappeared. So seeing the importance of that for the wildlife and obviously local recreation, um, a trust was set up and it's a body of people that are really passionate about the, uh, the rivers in, in general. And uh, I'm going to meet uh, Ramsey Ross and find out what the trust is all about. The Island Trust uh, is, is responsible for the entirety of the catchment of the Welland River down to the wash, its confluence with the, with the sea. And the objective is to improve the, the river and the habitat and its accessibility for people. I, I, before I get to our projects, I want to say something about, about the engagement that we have with our communities. We're a small organisation and the delivery of all our projects depend on community engagement to a greater or less extent and without them they wouldn't be successful. So we've carried out projects from the headwaters down to below where we are today on the, at the River Gouache. So one of the projects that we carried out is at uh, Smeaton Westerby. Uh, another one is, is at Lubinum, also up in the, in the headwaters, to provide improved flow for the river but also to provide accessibility for the community. Part of our measures was to put fencing along the edge of the river to stop cattle using the, 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 the river for drinking, but particularly the damage that they cause to the, 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 the banks and the consequent soil ingress uh, and, and silting that that causes in, in our river. So it's, it's actually to tailor where they have access to the water. Here at the, uh, at the Gouache, you, you can see that the river had previously been heavily canalised and it met the Welland um, in, in what was a, fl a floodplain uh, uh, originally. What we have done is we've sought to raise the bed to improve the flow of the river and also to reinstate some of the previous riffles that we have had to allow the river to take a more natural course on the land around us and thereby retaining water and reducing the amount of water that enters the river going downstream in times, in times of flood. One of the benefits that we will gain from it is it will provide accessibility for migratory fish such as sea trout because previously they simply couldn't access the gouache from the confluence here uh, with, the, with, the, with the Welland and, and this, this will improve the conditions in the river throughout the year. The, the river is a, an, a community asset that can be used by our community and anything that we do to, to damage it is detri detrimental to our use and the wildlife that it supports. Now, like many parts of the country, we understand the need for increased housing and, and, and that is true not just here. I think what we are concerned about is that the many of, much of the housing has not been developed with recognition of water neutrality and there are housing standards that now exist that for very little cost would allow us to build our houses in a water neutral manner where they have rainwater capture and, and, and what we are concerned about is the increase in uh, abstraction that, that, that may arise from substantially increased house building. So for this section of walk from uh, Spalding to Surfley you can walk all the way along the riverbank and uh, you pass the power station and the recycling centre and then the Anglian water treatment place. Um, yeah it's a really very very pleasant walk Wonderful. From Spalding to Surfley, you can stay on the riverbank pretty much all the way.
As the River Welland reaches Surfleet, um, I've made a slight detour because I want to see um, this important point. Um, this is one of those places, it's, it's a junction of the Welland, uh, a really important junction, and this is where it actually meets the uh, River Glen and also the Vernatch Drain. Now the Vernatch Drain runs the, uh, around the back of Spalding, whereas the River Glen runs through Surfleet and onwards that way. So uh, I'm going to take a look at the junction where they actually meet. And the River Glen is actually controlled by a sluice and that allows water into the River Welland obviously to prevent flooding in the Surfleet area. So uh, let's go and take a look at the junction. So this, this is it, this is as far as I can go at this point here. Um, my journey will continue on the opposite side of the river again and I shall head off towards uh, Fosdyke Bridge next. But uh, at this point here we can see that this is the flow coming from the River Glen and the Vernats Drain and then on this side obviously the Welland and it flows onwards uh, eventually ending up at the sea. So yeah quite an interesting point this. So just behind me here, dating from 1873, is the sluice that's controlling the water outflow from the Vernatz drain into the Welland. And as I said, the Vernatz drain runs around the back of Spalding and obviously prevents flooding in that kind of area. So at the moment it's allowing water out, so obviously this level of the Vernatz drain must be quite high. It's letting water out into the Welland. So yeah, quite a piece of engineering. So whilst this isn't actually an integral part of the uh, River Welland, I thought it was worthy of a mention because it's part of the local waterway system and really important. Now this sluice here at Surfleet serves a great purpose. Um, on this side of the river, you've got the River Glen that runs through Surfleet Reservoir and then on through Surfleet. Behind me, it runs into the River Welland. So without this sluice that regulates the flood water coming from this direction, then this area would likely be underwater and it's, it's had a few narrow escapes over the years. The River Welland's really in very, very good condition in most parts and uh, there's no wonder considering the amount of work that actually goes into maintaining it. And I'm going to speak to one of the people who are responsible for looking after the River Welland. The dredging aspect of, of the Welland uh, certainly is very important. Um, it's a contentious subject dredging but certainly we find in flat catchments such as this where the rivers are in effect man-made it is certainly necessary. The, the sediment from upstream pulls in the flat sections that you find in the fens and if it's not removed the rivers become in effect unusable. So it, it's quite important that it's, it's periodically cleansed. It's definitely an ongoing project. Um, it's, there are lengthy periods between dredging certainly but um, it is something that while the fens are here and are maintained I personally believe it, it's something that will have to be done you know, with regularity. Uh, we're responsible for the uh, drainage of the fens between uh, Peterborough and Wisbeach, um, encapsulate between the, the Welland and the Neen and um, yeah, not only is it our job to evacuate water, but during the summer months through locations such as this, this is where we sluice water in for agriculture and for wildlife as well. Today we're sluicing water out of the Welland. Um, this brings water into our catchment system and provides water for agriculture, irrigation and, and the wildlife in the, in the catchment. It is ve very important, um, provides water for uh, a lot of the root crops in the area, sugar beet, potatoes, 
during dry spells they have to be irrigated also the uh, the land in the borough fen especially is uh, is predominantly peat and if that is allowed to dry out during dry spring times that can in effect blow away so it's important we keep the sock level high and the land moist and the wellland provides a source for us to do that this is one of of three where we can three points where we can sluice water into our system from the wellland the wellland is of, of great importance certainly to the local community and to, to local agriculture um, without it it would become extremely dry in the summer uh, it provides us fresh water from upstream from the uplands which we can regulate into our catchment for use uh, for amenities and for agriculture over time the river needs constant uh, maintenance and that includes dredging and basically taking out the uh, deposits that are formed on the flats and the corners and things like that. So whilst I'm here at Surfleet I'm taking advantage um, of where they're actually dredging at the moment. I'm going to have a look at the kind of silt that they're actually pulling out and to be perfectly honest I'm very surprised because I thought it would be kind of like dirt and mud but it's not, it's actually more like sand. Um, in, in fact it is, it, it, it's actually sand. Uh, and this is what they've just literally pulled out of the corners of the of the wellland. Um, so in amongst the sand we've got seashells and, and all sorts of things, mussels and yeah, I, I'm really, really surprised. So having walked from Surfleet, I'm now arriving at uh, Fosdyke Bridge and pretty much all the way down here the river is really quite wide and straight um, it's obviously tidal and at the moment the tide is coming in by the looks um, and just beyond Fosdyke Bridge there's a wonderful marina and my next step after that will be Molten Marsh and uh, I'm actually getting very close to the uh, end of the river so onwards So I've just uh, set off on this part of the journey from uh, Molten Marsh Nature Reserve and now I've got uh, just one long straight so I'm on the final part of the journey and I'm basically following the River Welland to the point in the wash where it empties out and uh, it's quite a walk this bit and you can't get anywhere any closer really without having to do this walk but uh, yeah the end is in sight and I must say it's been a very very interesting journey and it's high tide at the moment and when the tide's out this is uh, almost mud flat and there's just a trickle in the bottom pretty much made it to the end of my journey and I'm about probably four miles short of the wash but you can't really get very close to uh, the actual point where it empties into the wash due to the to the marshes so it's, it's obviously not safe and at the moment uh, the, t the tide is at high tide but when the uh, when the tide goes down you'll see you'll see more of the mud flats but so yeah probably four or five miles that way is the uh, point where the Welland empties into the wash. Um, but I must say, I'm, I'm pleased I've made it to the end. It's been a very interesting journey and I've met some wonderful people along the way and seen some absolutely beautiful sights. And um, now I really can appreciate uh, how important the Welland is. And uh, now it's time to go home and have a nice cup of tea.